Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Olahudi Sammyao Samputoshe Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Sao Yu Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Supreme and Wondrous Dharma, Subtle and Profound rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Excuse me while I blow my nose. Ah, it just picks that perfect moment when I have to speak to tickle my nose. Ah, so today is Sunday. June 26th, here on the Gold Coast of Queensland, <laughs> amid my nose blowing, and it is Saturday, June 25th, back in California, wherever you are watching around the world, welcome to our Avatamsaka Sutra lecture. My name is Hung Shur. I'm very happy to welcome you here to uh, look into the, uh, the praises of the Buddha coming from the palace of the Suyama heaven. Uh, to get started, let's first invoke spiritual presence. See if I can tame my nose here. Here's how we do it. We do it with a melody. We're going to chant the Chinese uh, seven times through. Um, And we have one more 
task, which is to acknowledge country here in the Buddha Hall at the Gold Coast. Uh, we want to be mindful that the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language group practice spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and all creation in this location here where we're sitting for tens of thousands of years before we ever arrive. Today, we acknowledge them as traditional custodians of the land with gratitude as we share the land, with sorrow for the costs of the sharing, and the hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders past, present, and emerging, and as well, all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. All right. So here's our desktop. Uh, we have uh, a lot to share today, and uh, I wanted to start right off with our text so we can get going and share with you the other treasures of the Dharma today. Okay, here's our text. It's right there. Okay. We're going to read this paragraph right there. Make it just a little bigger. Okay, here we go. Shi Zhu Pusa, Chi Fo So Yi, Ding Li Fo Zu, Sui So Lai Fang, Ge Hua Zuo, Mo Ni Zhang, Shi Zi Zhi Zuo, Yu Qi Zuo Shang, Jie Jia Fu Zuo, Ru Zi Shi Jie Zhong, Ye Mo Tian Shang, Pusa Lai Ji, when each of the bodhisattvas arrived at the Buddha's place and bowed at respect at his feet, comma, according to the directions they came from, each of them made a mani treasury lion's throne and crossing their legs in full lotus, took their seat upon it. And just as it was with the bodhisattvas gathering in this world, Suyama heaven, so too did these events transpire in all the many worlds, with their bodhisattvas, their worlds, their tathagatas, and their names, the same in every way. Okay, so hey, what's going on? Um, what's going on is a scene, could be out of a movie. Um, it's preparation, there's action, there's a lot of activity going on. And it's preparation for the Buddha to speak the Dharma of the 10 practices and the 10 inexhaustible treasuries. Those are topics. Those are, you could say, sermons that he has to give. And the previous chapter that we spent about a month looking at, called chapter 19, ascending to a palace in the Suyama heaven, that was the um, preparation for chapter 20, where we are now. And so the Buddha announced he was going to speak Dharma. He traveled up to the Suyama heaven. I'm going to sneeze again. Excuse me one second. We've, we've had cold weather and the cold weather gets when I go from one room to the other. So the Buddha announced he was going to speak and there in the Siyama heaven, there was a lot of excitement because why the, the person in charge, the Deva, uh, who is, the, they call him the king. He's, he's the one who, whether it's a royalty or uh, however, however they organize it, the, the one in charge, said, oh boy, we got to get ready for the Buddha's coming. So he created a seat, a place for the Buddha to sit. And the Buddha accepted the invitation, came up. And the first thing that David did after bowing and, and saying, welcome, welcome, he said, I have welcomed 10 other Buddhas here. So you're next. And we're so happy to have you here. So that was the end of the last chapter. And there was this also this amazing thing, which is just purely Avatamsaka Sutra magic. And uh, I know some people hear this and, oh, I don't understand that, and reject it, throw it away. They leave, they don't wanna hear anymore because how could it happen that 
in worlds of the 10 directions as the Buddha was doing this, the same thing was happening, reflecting like a person breathing in and out in all 10 directions worlds. Do I see that? Do I know it's the case? I don't see it with my present set of senses, but you can take it from, from your faith mind that the Buddha wouldn't be telling us just a story, that uh, he knows it is the case, or you can just take it from an open mind and say, well, there are some people and some beings who see it, who can verify this is the case happening, uh, and let it be. You know, science, science can only give us uh, proof for things that it can measure, and there's no instruments, there's no bubble chamber, or no meter or yardstick that we can stretch out and say, oh, this is actually how the Buddha did it. This is what really happened. So however you make sense of it yourself, we can, we can park that magical side that one event happening in this world that the sutra is talking about is also happening simultaneously in worlds throughout 10 directions. So let's, let's move on past that and look at the parts that do make sense that we can work with. Uh, one of those would be moving on to chapter 20. What happened in chapter 20? Well, that's where we are. That's where we've only stepped into chapter 20. And what has happened is the audience has arrived. They know the Buddha's gonna speak. Oh boy, are they excited. Uh, bodhisattvas have arrived. And they each arrived, they named them, they were led by a bodhisattva whose name was Forest of Merit and Virtue. And we looked at the name forest in Chinese, Lin, two trees standing side by side. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the devas also reported the, world, the names of the worlds they came from and the names of the Buddhas in those worlds. So, when you hear this information, Currently not sharing. Yes, I understand. Uh, when when we hear this information, um, what do we what do we do with it? Um, you could just say, "Oh well, there's lots of chapters in the Avatamsaka where lists of names show up." But what I want to do is, instead of looking at it like two dimensionally, just kind of passing across as text, I want to go into that experience and say, let's pick one bodhisattva and imagine what that might be like to be a bodhisattva showing up to hear the Buddha speak Dharma. Um, can, we, can we put some flesh and blood on that and visualize what that might be like? Um, let's see. Let's see if we can do that. Um, no, not that. Hold on. I'm going to adjust my computer here and pick up that one and pick up that one. All right. Now, what, what do we have? Now I have to share my screen so you can see those things. Okay, take a look here. Um, forest of Merit and Virtue, you can visualize the redwood forest because you're looking at the Santa Cruz redwoods, not too far from the Pacific Ocean where California takes, the coast of California takes a turn there. Above Monterey, if you look for a map, you'd see Monterey. And look for the city of Santa Cruz. This is happening 13 miles uh, east of the city of Santa Cruz at a place called Boulder Creek. This is Redwood Vihara. And those lighter golden redwoods are that way because last year's fires burned them. You can see uh, to the right of your screen, you can see the trees here also were seriously burned. But uh, redwoods are hardy. They are resolute. They have endured fires before because they are minimum 300 years old, uh, some of them a thousand years old, the oldest. And what you're seeing is the humans there, 
there's one young gentleman who is, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. One young gentleman right here, there we go, in the center, uh, Alex, who is now Qin Li, strength, Li Liang, Li. And he today uh, set foot into the Buddha's family as a trainee. Um, here is Jin Chuan Shi. This is myself on the screen. <laughs> here is uh, Jin Fo Shi. Uh, here is Jin Wei Shi. Here is Jin Xiao Shi. These are the, uh, and Qin Liang. Qin Liang is here. Shramanera Qin Liang from. So, Malaysia, uh, Saratoga, California, just down the road from where they're sitting, Ohio, uh, Taiwan, Poland, and Vietnam. So, here's the International Sangha, and the young man in front here is a, a blend of born in Germany but raised in the U.S. and in Sydney, Australia. So, clearly, we have an a, uh, international group uh, of Sangha and and laity. The laity, you can see some of their faces, some of you recognize them. Taiwan, China, US, Malaysia, Cambodia, Singapore, Vietnam, yeah. And Master Hua's picture is right behind, right beside me here. So what are we looking at? Imagine that every one of those bodhisattvas who showed up at the Suyama heaven uh, had a beginning similar to this. And we're looking at one young man starting out on the path, but each one of the monastics there, the, the people with the bald heads, uh, had a similar calling at some point and set out on the path to uh, discover in a forest, similar to the redwoods here in Santa Cruz, uh, a forest of merit and virtue, to see what they could discover from their inner treasures. Now, I want to say a word about this. Um, the silver-haired laywoman here, white-haired laywoman, is Alex's uh, grand auntie who is very much a Buddhist. She, is a, she recites the Buddha's name uh, all the time. She is a devoted, devout, pure land devotee. Um, and she was the one who triggered Alex's interest. Let's make this, there we go, full, full screen. She was the one who triggered Alex's interest in the Dharma. Uh, so, Each one of us, some, all of you listening to the lecture today, um, began as I did, not knowing about the Dharma, never hearing the Buddha's name, never seeing a Sangha member, understanding the Dharma. But somehow, somebody connected us. Somebody was the link who made a bridge so that our feet could travel uh, across that bridge and, and encounter the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And then precepts for many of us, taking refuge, taking the precepts. It's the same story told over and over again. So, the people here in the center, the monastics, I have one more photo. Let's see if I can share this, another photo. I want number one. That's the one right here. All right, we'll close that. So look at this group here. Um, the thing that's different with these individuals and the, the group that you were looking at before is a, a commitment to let go of one part of life, which would be what? It would be seeking comfort, seeking well-being um, based on solid relationships with spouse, children, parents, with the security of money in the bank, 
um, with the ability to please any desire immediately that you could afford and it was legal. <laughs> so that's living at home. Those are the benefits of the home life and 99.5% of the world's population would agree that's what life is about. Security, relationships, comfort, and the pursuit of wealth and power and desires, satisfaction of desires. Okay, that's, you know, the world agrees. However, certain individuals throughout history have said there's more. There's more to gain. And you're looking at six of them here who agreed that there was nothing wrong with a life immersed in the senses except it didn't hit the spot. It also led to uh, affliction when those, the pursuit of desire didn't get satisfied. Also, there was a guaranteed end to the road of seeking, pursuing pleasure and running from pain, which was death, old age, sickness, and death. And indeed, uh, one individual 2,500 years ago suddenly face to face with the reality of old age, sickness, and death said, no, 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 no way. I'm going to find out whether or not mortality can end. I'm going to take birth and death and rebirth as my challenge. That individual, of course, was our founder, Shakyamuni, the prince of the Shaki clan. He was an aristocrat. He was, a, he was royalty, right? And his first five disciples were also royalty. The, the five monks who uh, followed him out, trying to get him to pull him back into the palace, but then eventually left home on their own. So the Buddhist Sangha, in fact, interestingly enough, is the longest running fraternity on the planet. And also, if you were looking for job security, go be a Buddhist monk. <laughs> Your company's never gonna fold, never gonna go bankrupt. It won't be absorbed by a larger conglomerate uh, after the stock, gets, the stock options merge, you know. So uh, the Buddha Sangha, the monastics who follow the Buddha, as you're seeing in this picture, one did today, um, have always existed. They've always been around throughout most of recorded human history. So that's, that's interesting. That's a kind of job security, right? But here's the point that I want to make, that what, what you're seeing in this photograph is these six individuals coming from Vietnam, Poland, Taiwan, uh, Australia, US, uh, and Malaysia, including the one on the screen there on the altar. I'm, <laughs> I've already been set up, a, you know, I'm a Pai Wei, look at that. I'm, a <laughs> I'm already a Pai Wei. I, uh, so, uh, oh, excuse me, I wanna point out that there's no power coming here, why not? Is this plugged in? Can you help, yeah, good. I'm glad I saw that there wasn't. I uh, probably have enough juice to, to power it, but let me try again. I don't want to run out of electricity at some point. Ah, got it. Thank you. Glad I saw that. Okay, so the point I want to make is what these six individuals coming from all over the world, right, truly spanning the globe, um, they all were willing to let go of that pursuit of comfort, security, power, and the satisfaction of desires, pursuit of the satisfaction of desires, in order to find something else. And that's when I gave my talk today to the group, and uh, I, I want to extend this to the Avatamsaka Sutra, because all the bodhisattvas named uh, in our lecture last week, who now are, they all are sitting in full lotus waiting for the Buddha, waiting for their chance to praise the Buddha. Every one of them took as their preference, as their choice, not attacking the five desires or putting them, 
you know, saying they're bad, not defaming them, but saying there's something else inside my heart that I'm going to develop. I'm going to train the quality in my heart of humanity at another level. So what do we say? We say, We say, okay, I'm gonna unshare my screen. Okay, we say, uh, there's this phrase that is really a, a kind of sums up Master Hua's approach to the Dharma, which is, we learn, for, I, I said it right, let me pick up the way, uh, oh, not that, just a moment here, not that, not that, uh, I'm going to have to go find it again here, here it is, here it is, the, the phrase is, um, we learn about the Buddha by developing our full humanity. When we become the best possible human being, Buddhahood is accomplished right there. I'm gonna put it in Chinese so you can see it. Uh, this is an important phrase for the way we approach Buddhism. It's right here. Ren, oh, not that way. Here we go. Ren, Dao, Jin, Fu. Dao, Cheng. There we go, right there. And this is preceded by a, another phrase, which is Xue Fu Zuo Ren. There we are. Okay. Xue Fu Zuo Ren is this phrase in English, right there. And this phrase is represented by the English there. Now, folks who are staring at the screen hoping that I make it bigger, let me do it. Here we go. All right, and that, and that. Yes, aha. This is making the best use of our virtual lecture here. Okay, here it is. Xue Fu, study Buddha, zuo ren, be a person. The Chinese is really terse, right? We learn about the Buddha by developing our full humanity. That's a good English translation of this phrase. And Ren, human path, that's the Tao of Taoist, or the Tao, right? Ren Tao, when the Ren, when the path of humanity comes to its end, meaning full development, for Tao, Buddha path, Cheng, is accomplished. When we become the best possible human being, Buddhahood is accomplished. All right, that's a good translation of that. Now, let me explain. Oh, you can't see it, can you? Oh my goodness, I again forgot to share my screen. Let me try it again, here we go. All right, there it is right there. Shui Fu Zuo Ren. We learn about the Buddha by developing our full humanity. Ren Dao Jin, Fu Dao Cheng. When we become the best possible human being, Buddhahood is accomplished. There it is right there. All right, now here's the deal. How we interpret that is to say that that photo that you saw of the six the monastics, one's a trainee, one's a novice, and there are four bhikshus, full, fully ordained. Um, those are people who said the outside stuff is good, but the inside stuff is better. The inside stuff includes what? It includes things like virtue, a good heart. Native Americans talk about the good heart, the good mind, kindness, compassion, insight, patience, perspective, and the absence of things. No anger, no greed, or let's say less anger, less greed. No delusion, less delusion. All of those inner qualities are latent in you and in me, and they're manifest, they're trained and developed and simply paid attention to and acknowledged and honored and valued by those individuals who you saw and every person who's ever left home with the Buddha. 
That's the reason. That's what those bodhisattvas have done, whom we are going to meet today, the ones who each of them and each of their directions sat down on a lotus flower, according to their direction, and put their palms together and got ready to hear the Dharma, and each take turns to praise. That's what I mean when I say we want to take it away from two dimensions, just the names, the list of names, and go into their experience. Um, I think each of them had a similar story to tell. And we can take the Avatamsaka Sutra as long ago and far away and somehow in the heavens, or we can say this is a telling of genuine reality. This is how it was when the Buddha spoke the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is a historical moment. This happened. And people were touched by it to the point where they said, we have to preserve it. We have to protect this because it's so valuable. It's so good. Okay, now I'm gonna ask in a different way. When, when we pick this up, when we all pick up our phone or our electronic gadget, we're going to be using our eyes, we're going to be using our ears mostly. There's not much tactile from a phone. You hold it, you put it on the stand, you charge it. Mostly eyes. And we can also use our, our mouths to talk into it. But the energy is going out. We're reading, we're watching, we're spending time using our senses externally. We have to set aside that virtual world that our phone is a gateway into so that we can take our eyes and our ears and our mouths and calm them, tame them, quiet them, and reflect. Because all spiritual progress ultimately begins with a reflection, with a coming to grips with our senses, and bit by bit by bit, listening, experiencing what we're feeling right this minute. And then, depending on the support we get for this search externally, what are our friends doing? If our friends are taking us out to the party, taking us out to shop, taking us out to an event, or encouraging us to sit with them on the sofa while we watch a movie, um, then the inner search that begins by calming our senses has to wait, postpone, becomes less important. Interestingly, the, one of the uh, silver linings of the pandemic was the, uh, the enforced containment in our homes because we were not allowed to leave quarantine. So what do you do? that many people said, maybe I'll try meditation. Maybe this mindfulness stuff will give me something to do to pass the hours because I'm sick of looking at my walls and my ceiling and these faces of the people who I, I'm related to them, but I can't relate to them, you know. So many people did, tried meditation, tried mindfulness because they had no other choice. Not a bad deal. That's what it takes to get us to put the reflection forward on our priorities list. Well, a bodhisattva, for sure, is someone who long ago did that and then, lo and behold, discovered that inside was a clean and well-lit place and it was worthy of setting an order. So, 
how strange many of us when we do, when we investigate for the first time meditation, get past all the, what are you going to do with that sitting like a bump on a log? Why don't you go out and do something productive? All of the flack that we get from people who haven't tried it yet. When we get through that and we sit still, wow, many of us discover, oh my goodness, that scary place. There's so much garbage inside. All of those memories, all those doubts, all those regrets, all that vengeance, all, those un all that unfinished business inside. And depending on, boy, it really requires a supportive environment, friends who say, it's okay, it's okay. Everybody does that. You have to clean the closet. You have to put it in order. You have to, you want to make a garden, you got to go out and plow the ground. You have to take a shovel or a pick or a rototiller until the ground is broken up and then you have to take a, a trowel and break it up more. You have to put in some fertilizer. You have to water it. You have to put a fence around it to keep the dogs and the kids and the bikes out of it. Then you can start to plant the seeds. This is called real life gardening on the mind ground. In the mind, it's the same way. You have to work with it. You have to soften up the soil. And it's not at first, but if you do that, if you have friends who encourage you, if you have a role model who's done it, says, yeah, this is correct, this is the method, then you discover, hey, I choose for the invisible internal goodness of patience, because why? I held my temper, I didn't get angry. When I had the chance to, it felt amazing to hold my temper and not blow up. I felt so powerful that I actually could practice patience. Who knew? And as soon as I did that, you know what? My meditation suddenly got I experienced that. That was my own experience. So this is this, this reality that once we commit somehow to looking within, to counting our inner treasures instead of pursuing the outer stuff, it works and there's a reward. How, there's an amazing story. Our colleague and Dharma brother, Doug Powers, is uh, taught at Berkeley High School for 36 years. His specialty was 17-year-olds. 17-year-olds are a special animal. They are just out of childhood. Their bodies are the bodies of adults. Their minds are just out of childhood. They're heading out of adolescence, but they still have all the mood swings and all of the hormone imbalances and frustration of having your body be different every morning when you wake up you've grown and you're changed and your clothes don't fit and you have these feelings and yet you're not an adult you're not you're still somebody's child you know that's a hard age 17 is a hard age depending on your friends and the challenges that skillful adults give you you go from there to adulthood so this is when Doug Powers was at his best uh, still is, you know, but was this was his specialty for 36 years. He retired now and moved on to higher education. But uh, those, those years of teaching 17-year-olds, it's a special calling to be able to do that. And he and I started the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery back in 1995, and it was an old church two blocks from one block, one walking block, the short end of the block from Berkeley High School. You had to cross McKinley Avenue, you had to cross Martin Luther King Avenue, and there you were. Berkeley has one high school, and uh, one public high school. So all kinds of kids, kids from the hills, the children of the professors from UC Berkeley, and the kids from the flats, everybody else, all went to the, sat in the same classroom. And Doug taught the AP classes, and one of his AP classes was called uh, uh, human psychology and introduction to Western psychology. So in Berkeley, it's very important to keep church and state separate as it should be uh, in public education. And so Doug uh, wanted 
to introduce his students to the meditation hall at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, but he couldn't do it calling it meditation, so they called it uh, scientific investigation of concentration. That was what he called it, sick stuff. So he, uh, that was how he told the, the kids, he said, tell your parents that you've been investigating uh, consciousness and concentration, scientific investigation of consciousness uh, in, a, in a, uh, an ancient way. You're using uh, traditional paradigms to investigate consciousness. That was, what was he doing? He was teaching them how to meditate. And so uh, I was there watching and Doug is, you know, he's been a disciple of Master Hua as long as I have, 1973. We all took refuge. Uh, and so the, these, these kids came in you know, here's 40 Berkeley high school kids sitting in the Buddha hall at the Berkeley Buddhist monastery, kind of going, oh, what the hell, I'm not sure what I'm doing here, you know. So Doug says, okay, here, you put this leg here, you put this leg here, just, okay, calm. He said, just let your eyes watch your nose, let your nose watch your mouth, let your mouth watch your mind, and we're going to be quiet. I'll ring the bell, y'all get to hear this bell, and then Doug would go, you want to hear the bell? Nice bell, you know, you get to hear that. And he said, I'll, I'll ring it again when I want you to, to come back. And, and so these kids, some of them were athletes, some of them were nerds, some of them were on their way to Stanford and Berkeley, others were on their way to Juvenile Hall, you know, all kinds of kids here. And boys and girls together. And so they, they went, ah, might as well try it, what the hell, you know, like, okay. And they sat, and quietly, and then 10 minutes later, sometimes five minutes later, ding, rang the bell. All right, so what was that like? And these kids who, you know, by the age of 13, they'd all experimented with every kind of intoxicant, and you know, these, these kids are very worldly wise for adolescence, but they all went, with almost without exception, they went, Mr. Powers? I felt something. That was amazing. And, and there were no batteries. I didn't have to plug in. I didn't have to reach. It was like, that was amazing, Mr. Powers. Well, could we do that again? You know? And, and from those early introductions to meditation came a group of hardcore meditators who never miss a day. They still do it. They're now in their 20s. Uh, this was, you know, 20, almost, almost 30 years ago, which is scary. Berkeley Monastery uh, has been there since 1995, so 2020s, yeah. So um, a group of young men and young women um, from that first experience of meditation have never missed a day since then, because why? They discovered their inner treasures unmediated by, by the internet, unmediated by the marketplace. You couldn't buy it, you couldn't sell it. Nobody could take it away from you. Their parents had nothing to do with it except invisibly all the blessings that brought them there. But it was theirs. That was their own experience. And we, I'm still in touch with half a dozen of those, those young men and women who first experienced meditation in Doug Power's sick class, Scientific Investigation of, concentration, of Consciousness. And they said, you know, um, that was actually one of the first times I realized that I lived in my body and my mind, that I was, I existed, because I had that experience, and it was mine, you know. And so it got to be a thing, and then Doug would come over, and he would say, let's try it today without talking, you know. Let's just, you don't, you don't know what to do. Go on in, sit. They, these, Students would come in, put their book bags to one side, cross their legs, and sit for half an hour. And they would go, best part of my day, best, best class of my life, you know. So that inner, this is all stemming from what I said today during the ceremony to uh, welcome uh, Chin Li, trainee Chin Li, into our and to the Buddhist family as a trainee. Uh, he will be a trainee for a certain number of months uh, creating merit and virtue to sustain him on his search to become a novice, a shramana, shramanera, 
followed by uh, the search to become a bhikshu and to take the bodhisattva precepts. So, um, the point that I made that I want to reiterate was if you look behind me, there in the altar, you see Vairochana Buddha, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva, and Manjushri Bodhisattva. Um, these are, uh, are they historical figures? Well, depends on how long your view of history is. In any case, they symbolize humans who let go of the external search for pleasure, avoiding pain, seeking wealth, seeking comfort in relationships, seeking something that's real or true or lasting outside and exchanged it for tuning into and giving time, focusing on the search for inner wealth, well-being, permanence, true self, purity, and virtue. So um, the outer stuff, you might get it for a while, but it goes away really fast. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone, right? And they traded that for something that is always, always, always available to you if you tune into it. It's never gone away, right? The Tao, Master Hua would say, Bukho Shu Yu Er Li Ye. You can't leave the Tao behind for even an instant. It's never not there. It's just that we go away from it. We stop looking. We give our time to what? What do you trade your valuable, priceless time for? Mostly these days, four or five hours a day, more. And there's value there. It's just you can't compare to that flavor of what you discover once we look inside. All right. End of sermon for the moment. No, no, don't end the sermon. Okay, let's, let's do this. Now that I have been preaching, I want to share something with you. Um, here we go. This is, okay, I'm going to bring this up. I hope it works. Last time I tried to get it to work, it didn't work. Um, and let me share my screen. Here we go. Now, we're going to, you've been listening to my voice steadily for quite a while here. I'm going to share something different. Just takes, I think, two and a half minutes. Are we ready? Here we go. The title of this is Rustic Monks in the Wilderness Using Sharing Video Editing Screen. Yes, I, I know. Thank you. I will. Going to optimize screen share video clip. There we go. Um, Every one of those bodhisattvas whose names we are hearing at some point did what you're going to be seeing here. I'm going to narrate as we go. Ready? Here we go. Play. Play, maestro. Rustic monks in nature. This is the home life. Set foot on the path leading out to try your best into the wilderness, courtesy of Emily. Ah, far into the wilderness, deep. How far does it take us? put up with a lot of discomfort to experience. You get to a place you look within. Ah, you look deeply within. You find an Aranya still in quiet place to support you. You put up with all kinds of conditions, including heavy rain. It doesn't deter you from your search. Day and night, 
unswerving. Your quest for samadhi and inner riches. You encounter other living beings. Deep in the forest. Forest of merit and virtue. Ah, the Avatamsic estate. Day and night. The forest becomes your favorite place. Companions along the way. And light arises from within. And what was a search that was black and white and two dimensional, one day fully realized. All right. There you go. How about that? So that's a palate cleanser, right? You still had to listen to my voice, but there we go. We'll close this. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, let's get back to our text. What do you say? Pop this up. And here we go. So each of the bodhisattvas came to where the Buddha was and they bowed in respect at his feet. It's the first thing the bodhisattvas do is they salute the Buddha. And they all came from different directions. And like the Deva king made a throne, they too make a lion's throne made of mani, this jewel-like substance. Crossing their legs in full lotus, they took their seat upon it. I think it's so interesting that the sutra specifies that they all sit in full lotus. Um, half lotus will do just fine. If you can do full lotus, train your body to do it. Just as it was with the bodhisattvas gathering here in this world's Suyama heaven, likewise in all the worlds, with the bodhisattvas' worlds and their Buddhas and their names, it was the same in every way. Okay, we're good. Here we go. Our Shi Shi Zun Song Liang Zu Shang Fang Bai Chien Yi Miao Si Guang Ming Pu Zhao Shi Fang Yi Che Shi Jie Ye Mo Gong Zhong Fu Ji Da Zhong Mi Bu Jie Xian. Then the Bhagavan released billions of lights of marvelous hues from his two feet. The light shone everywhere on worlds in ten directions and lit up every Buddha and every one of the gatherings in Suyama Heaven palaces in every world. Okay. Let's look at the language of this passage. Bhagavan. Bhagavan is Shizun, world one honored by the world and by those beyond the world. So, uh, the, the, this, among the Buddha's titles, this is one that his disciples often called him. They would say, oh, Bhagavan, you know, when they use him as a noun of address. World honored one. It's a term of respect. Um, he, look at, what did he do <laughs> from his feet? Came light. People might find this strange, but in the, the seven locations and nine occasions of the Avatamsaka, the Buddha releases light from a different portion of his body every time. So sometimes from the crown of his head. Um, anybody who recites the Sharangama mantra, Arshur Shirdzun Sung Ro Ji Ding, you know, uh, they, before we recite the Sharangama mantra, there's the buildup, and then it says from the crown of his head, from the Wujen Ding, from the invisible summit on the crown of his head, comes a light 
which releases sound, which is the Sharangama mantra. So that's, the, in fact, the title of the Sharangama has to do with the Buddha releasing light from his head. Here, the Buddha's releasing light from his feet. Later on in the sutra, it comes from his knees uh, and, you know, in different parts of the body. Um, including also the, this, the white hair tuft between his eyes, they say. So this is from the feet. Lots of lights in many marvelous colors. In Chinese it says, miao si guang ming. Lights of amazing colors. Just marvelous, marvelous colors. The lights shine in all directions and what you see in that light are Buddhas in Suyama Heaven Palaces in all the worlds of the Ten Directions. So we should understand that the light that the Buddha is releasing has a function. What's it doing? He is empowering all the bodhisattvas named Forest of Merit and Virtue who are about to speak Dharma. So all those Suyama Heaven Palaces worth of bodhisattvas sitting there who've arrived, we know their names, we know where they came from, we know the names of the Buddhas in those lands. They too are getting the light of the Buddha preparing to speak Dharma. Okay? Next step in our preparation. Here we go. Just then, the Bodhisattva, Forest of Merit and Virtue, received the Buddha's awe-inspiring strength, contemplated everywhere in all directions, and chanted the following verses in praise. Okay. Action. Roll them. Cameras are rolling. Forest of Merit and Virtue is about to step into his role as uh, interlocutor. He's the speaker. He's the, the bodhisattva host who's going to deliver the teachings on behalf of the Buddha. So right here, if, you could, if it was a movie, you'd see this energy leaving the Buddha and forest of merit and virtue in this world and all the worlds, getting that energy and looking around. What's he doing when he contemplates in all directions? He's checking out who's there because he's about to do a job and we'll be listening to him. Uh, he's the first speaker. Notice... Uh, Oh, I wanted to share. Let's see here. Um, I, ha I saw something that people will appreciate. Hold on here. We're going to close that and bring up. Hold on here. There it is, right there. That's what I want. Oh, 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 oh. Nope. Nope. Hold on. Yes, that's what I want. Okay. I want to show you how long our chapter is. So there we go. This is the entire chapter 20 uh, in Chinese, yes. For those of you, I just wanted to show you the size. So where are we? We are here. That's the passage we just looked at. This was all the preparation. The bodhisattvas arriving, their names, their Buddha's names, the lands they come from. And Forest of Merit and Virtue Bodhisattva, he's the bold print. This is what he says next. These are his praises. He's going to praise the Buddha, and there it is in Chinese. We're going to see this in Chinese and English, Chinese and English, Chinese. And English. But that's the sum of it right there. Followed by he introduces another bodhisattva whose name is Wisdom, Forest of Wisdom Bodhisattva. They all are forest of something. Forest of Wisdom, followed by Forest of Victory, followed by Forest of Courage, Fearlessness, followed by Forest of Shame and Remorse, Repentance, Renewal Bodhisattva, followed by Forest of Vigor, followed by forest of strength, forest of practices, and then forest of awakening. Okay, that's, oh, I'm sorry, I stopped too soon. That was nine. Number 10, forest of knowledge. He's the last one. 
That's it. So there we go. Those ten bodhisattvas each give their verses. They praise. That's what they're about. Okay? That's where we'll be. I'm going to sneeze here. Luckily, Zoom lets me sneeze off mic. So, between now and when we finish our chapter, that's what we'll be looking at, is that list of bodhisattvas and the praises they give. Um, Forrest Merit and Virtue is the first one. And I found something quite marvelous. Um, I found a graphic. It's a, a Zen painting. That is to say, um, it was painted by a Japanese court painter from the Muromachi dynasty. Um, which was 15th century, 14th, 15th century. And here it is. I want to share it with you all. It's a painting. He calls it the Buddha coming out of the woods. Shan Zhong uh, Shi Jia. Zhong Shan Zhong Chu Lai. You could also translate it as the Buddha coming out of the wilderness or just literally from the mountains. But this is a court painter from, you know, 1450 maybe, Muromachi period, as he understood how the Buddha would look as he came back into society, came back among his disciples. Um, what I liked, I identified with the expression on the Buddha's face because I have felt this way uh, personally. Let's see here. We want to make it. Here we go. This is a high res picture. You can make it really big. Um, he's got many of the Buddha's um, 32 hallmarks here. But what I like is the humanity depicted here. This is the former prince, right? The prince used to have somebody probably who plucked his eyebrows, uh, somebody who powdered his face, who took care of his cooking, who had servants helping him get dressed. He was, he was a prince. He was royalty with a staff. And now he's an ascetic. This is what he looks like after years in the woods. And they say that the Buddha often would leave his disciples even and go off look at look at his body is he well fed no he's not he's skin and bones but he's stronger than any 10 men his same age look what he's got on his feet bare feet and he could use a toenail clipper <laughs> so here's the prince after cultivation and he looks I'll put it back down to this is uh full size. Let's see, this is original size. Original size, scale it down. There we go. Um, here he is. He's been meditating a lot. He's been hearing the birds. He's been sharing his food with the elephants. And he's got that thousand foot stare in the 50 foot room. You know, he's looking very far because of what he has discovered in his mind. Now, what I liked about that image, what I like about this image is its humanity and its recognizable uh, state of someone who has been using their mind inside, who's been reflecting. Um, he doesn't look like anybody, the board of, the, uh, board of directors or the... Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the stockholders would hire to kill in the marketplace, does he? He looks like somebody you could give your child to safely, who would be a good role model for young people, somebody who 
if you were feeling completely blue, completely distressed over some disaster in your life, you could sit with him and tell him, and he would understand. This is someone who has not used his mobile phone. (laughs) The mobile phone is probably full of moss, (laughs) covered by leaves. He's been listening to the inner broadcast, right? This is a wonderful picture of uh, a cultivator of the way coming back into society. This, the, the, the painter specified that he's ready to engage again and to hear your troubles and to come up with a solution for you. But how do we now, I'm going to close it now, how do we relate to uh, a spiritual person, somebody who has found spiritual wealth inside by letting go of what's outside because how many breaths do we have in our bodies? What are you gonna do with the breaths and the time you have with your life? Um, It's a toss up. We will find wealth and value in whatever we choose to focus on. If we focus internally, we can develop that resilience and that strength and that ability to help others. If we focus entirely on externals, we may gather knowledge, we may gather connections and relationships, but when hard times come, we may not have any resources to bring to bear on the issues that that surround us. So how do we get to a place now, let's say, let's, the question that I would raise from this is, what do we do with this, uh, this connection we have to the Dharma and the people in the Sangha? I'm going to suggest that one thing we can do is recite their names. Last week, I tried for the first time... Uh, introducing you the, to the names of the seven Tathagatas. Here they are. Look here. The names of the seven Buddhas. Mm. Again, I'm going to start right here. Take a look here. Namo do barulai. Namo do barulai. Next one. Namo bao shang rulai. Namo, namo bao shang rulai. Next one. More syllables this time. Namo miao shai shang rulai. Chinese. Get used to it. Ready? Here we go. Namo guang bo shang rulai. Next one. Fewer syllables. Namo li bu we ru lai. Next one. Namo gan lu wang ru lai. And the last one who should be familiar for some reason. Look. Namo amito ru lai. What is this? These are the names of seven Buddhas, uh, of the many, 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 many numbers of Buddhas who have been celebrated throughout time, throughout space and time. These Buddha's names come up for recitation, for us to recite. They're a gift to us from the past. And the story goes that when we recite these Buddha's names, good things happen. It is a way of relating to the Buddha 
similar to what? To what these bodhisattvas are going to be doing in the Suyama heaven. The bodhisattvas have come to the palace of the Suyama heaven to praise the Buddha. Well, why don't we do the same thing? Okay? And we can do it in a traditional way, which I will share with everybody right now. What's the good part about reciting the name of... His name, Namo, means I return to, I find strength in, I find my refuge, safe harbor in the, oops, try again, the Tathagata, or Buddha, same, the thus come one, whose name is Many Treasures. Do, this word right here, Do, that's how you say it. Lots, much, abundant. Bao, jewels, treasures, wealth, riches. Rulai, Tathagata, the one thus come. That's those two characters. Namo, you see this character right here? That, let's make it bigger. I'm going to make it bigger. There it is. Oh, that's not bigger. Okay, so Namo means Namaha in Sanskrit. I come back to, I find safe harbor. This is where I am safe. My homeland security is right here. Namo. Do, multiple, bao, treasures, tatagata. How do you say it? Namo, do, bao, rulai. Oh. Notice one, rulai, two, rulai, three, rulai, four. Every one of these names has in it this, these two Chinese words, which means tatagata. The one who comes thus. Just the title of the Buddha, like Bhagavan. We just had Bhagavan. Okay? So there we go. That's the first one. Namo Do Bao Rulai. What do the Chinese say? There is a tradition. This is a traditional way of talking about it. They say, um, when we recite the name of the Buddha, many treasures, we can leave the three paths of misery behind. It also gets rid of stinginess. We purge that narrowness of heart in ourselves and the retribution of poverty is far from us. We will be enriched by reciting the name of Do Bao Rulai, the Buddha many treasures. Every time, it's, this is an interesting way of applying it. I like this, this commentary. It says, every time we go out shopping, when we go to somebody's store, if we recite, Namo, Namo, Do, Bao, Ru, Lai, just like that, we can wish that our friend behind the counter or the owner of the shop gets wealthy, finds, finds business to do, that our friends in retail uh, get success. They don't go out of business. When we see poor people, we can help them by reciting the name of the Buddha, many treasures. Uh, when, uh, if we understand that people who are poor now did so because of theft, stealing in the past, we can wish them through the, name, the intervention of the name of the Buddha that they find blessings and well-being in the future. So if you are someone who is a business person, if you work and live in the marketplace, recite the name of Namo Duobao Rulai and you will find success and happiness. Okay, there it is. Here it is. How's it go? Namo Duobao Rulai. You want to try it with me? It's simple, right? That melody is so simple. Try it again. Oop, let's try it. Here we go. Ready? One, two. Okay, that's the first one. That's the first one of the seven Buddha's names. The seven Tathagatas. When do we recite the seven Tathagatas names? Every single day in the monastery when we do the, the uh, um, Mengshan Shishi, 
that second part of our ceremonies every night. Namo do baorulai. And now, number two, look. Same number of syllables. Namo bao sheng rulai. Not only the same number of syllables, the same word. Look at that. Bao, bao. There it is. Treasures, jewels, wealth. Sheng, victory. Uh, supremacy in the best sense of being among the best. It's supremacy that's not exclusive. It means you come out on top. What does it mean? The Tathagata jewel victory. Okay. Now, what does the commentary say? It says, when we release the living, when we do the ceremony called liberating life, whether it's fish or birds, if we recite for them, Bao Sheng Rulai, the name Jewel Victory, there will be two spirits that appear on the side of each of those creatures to protect them. That there's a blessing that comes from the Buddha's name created by the Buddha's own vows and practices that allows spirits to appear beside the creatures who we liberate. Now this can be who? Your pets. Imagine your pets at home, your goldfish, your turtles. If you're in Australia, your, your goanna, ah, your cockatoo, your kookaburra, your, you know, kurawang, whatever you have. Maybe you are raising a python. If you recite the name, Namo Bao Sheng Rulai, then Pang Sheng Ho Zhi Ren Si Zhi Qian. Before we die, if the situation arrives when we have to say goodbye to our pets, and we are, if they hear the name of Bao Sheng Rulai, this, this Buddha, Bao Sheng Tathagata, they will not again fall into the realm. They won't retain their animal body, they will be reborn as a person. So, this is a very good thing to recite when we go into the butcher shop or when we go past the, uh, the grocery store with the fish and the crabs and the lobsters in the tanks outside or restaurants, right? We go in and we recite Bao Namo Bao Sheng Rulai and those, the consciousness of those beings in those animal bodies hear it and they find a path to transcend. That's the victory, the jewel victory here. So leaving the animal's realm is a victory for beings who want to proceed on to Buddhahood in an end to suffering entirely. So what do we do? We go, right, namo, we know that one. Bao, we know that one. Sheng, easy to say in English, sheng. Rulai, Tathagata, here's, here's how it goes. Let's put it together with the first one. Remember? Let's try this. Ready? Here we go. Namo do bao rulai. Namo bao sheng rulai. Again. Namo do bao rulai. Namo bao sheng rulai. One more time. Namo do bao rulai. Namo bao sheng rulai. Hey, you're getting good at it. Your Chinese is improving. What about number three? Look at this one. Oh my goodness. Um, you're gonna copy that one and park it below. Now, what's the same here? The same is the namo part and also the rulai part. So this word is the same as this one, as this one, and these are the same, right? The rulai and the rulai and the rulai. Here we go. Three rulais and three namos. So if we learn one, we've already got three. There it is. Namo, namo, namo. Right? Okay. 
So what, is, what do we have here? Miao, wondrous, marvelous, incredible. Se, color, shape, form, visual input. Shen, body. So the Buddha, the Tathagata or the Buddha with a marvelously formed body. Beautiful body Buddha. <laughs> right? So that's what it means. We're going to chant it in Chinese because that's how the melody works. But you understand what it means. So beautiful body Buddha. And you think, oh, that just sounds disrespectful. It's not. The Buddha's own cousin, Ananda, when he saw his cousin now as a Buddha, mind you, the Buddha went away for six years. The prince, Siddhartha, went away, and his cousin lost track of him. But when he realized Buddhahood and then came back, oh, Ananda was like, oh, wow, I want to be like you. And this is somebody, Ananda was supposed to be a very uh, well put together person himself, very attractive person, handsome. But he saw the Buddha and said, ah, that's the way I want to look. So, miao, si, shen, miao, shai, shen, rulai. Shai is the Manchurian dialect pronunciation. You could, some people will recite it, si, right? Miao, si, shen, rulai. Miao, shai, shen, rulai. This is how Shifu pronounced it. Okay, what does the commentary say? Commentary says, when ghosts hear, namo miao, shai, shen, rulai, I take refuge in the Buddha with a marvelously formed body. When I hear that name, they can become spirits and leave the realm of ghosts. Okay, now, somebody says, ghosts? Ghosts? We're talking about ghosts. This is the Buddha Dharma, and the Buddha Dharma includes beings who have consciousness but no physical body. Every culture affirms the existence of ghosts. We have fun, funny relationships with ghosts. Walt Disney talks about them as Casper the friendly ghost, you know. Uh, in Chinese, Japanese, Korean culture, Vietnamese culture, afraid of ghosts. They don't like ghosts. So there's no Casper the friendly ghost in, in Chinese culture. But their, their reality cannot be denied. In this realm, the, that are part of the ten Dharma realms, there are ghosts and there are spirits. Ghosts, they say, are a, con, are a gathering of dark negative energy. Spirits are a gathering of bright, lighted energy, both not embodied. They're disembodied. They're looking for a body, and they can come back into bodies, but it's hard to leave once you're in that realm of ghosts. So, here is a Buddha whose name is Miao Si Shen Rulai, Miao Sai Shen Rulai, he said, I acknowledge the reality of ghosts. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to use my energy to go into their reality and bring them out into humanity, devas, bodhisattvas, sages, and Buddhas. So how compassionate is that? That's why this is a very useful commentary. It says, okay, if you want to help ghosts out, recite the name Miao Si Shen Rulai, Miao Shai Shen Rulai. Furthermore, a more practical use perhaps for those of us more grounded in our senses, if you want to be beautiful, if you want to be attractive and handsome, if you want to, it says, conceive a child, if you decide you want to expand your family, we're not going to make any comments about the Supreme Court in the United States. Uh, if you want to be good looking and handsome or beautiful or conceive a child, once you recite Namo Miao Si Shen Rulai, your body feels the effects. You plant the seeds of a harmonious and attractive appearance and your child that you wish to conceive will also be very attractive, very good looking. When you recite the name of the Buddha, 
you can plant seeds for being attractive, wholesome, well-balanced, and healthy your entire life. Sound good to you? I hope so. So, Namo Miao Shashan Rulai. Let's have, let's do all three. What do you say? Here we go. Ready? We'll start with Do Bao Rulai. Namo Do Bao Rulai. Namo Bao Shan Rulai. Namo Miao Shashan Rulai. That has more syllables, right? You add one. Namo Miao Shashan Rulai. Namo Do Bao Rulai. Namo Bao Shan Do it again. We'll do it down here. Namo do bao ru lai. Namo ba shen ru lai. Namo nyap sha shen ru lai. Again. Namo do bao ru lai. Namo ba shen ru lai. Namo nyap sha shen ru lai. One more time. Namo do bao ru lai. Namo ba shen ru lai. Namo nyap sha shen ru lai. Yes, indeed. By golly. We, like the bodhisattvas of the climbing, the praises in the palace of Asuyama heaven, like those bodhisattvas, we too are learning to praise the Buddha and all the benefits that come to us for doing that. Well, what do you know? These uh, seven Tathagata's names are wonderful beyond imagining. So next week, we're going to start with number, we're going to reverse, we're going to rehearse numbers one, two, and three, and go on to finish up next week with the other four. So practice this week, and I look forward to uh, hearing your recitation of the seven Tathagata's names next week. Why not? And they say, it'll do you no harm. What have you got to lose? Berkeley Monastery. All right, I would like now, let's see here if I can. I'd like to invite, I'm gonna unshare my screen here. Oops, 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 that's not what I wanna do. There we go. I would like to, I can see, um, am I early? Oh, I'm still early, by two minutes. Um, the monks of the Berkeley Monastery are going to let us know about their practices. They're down in Santa Cruz Redwoods, maybe they're having trouble getting online. Let's see, we'll give them just a minute. If they don't show up, I will do the tour myself. All right, what do you think about those seven Tathagatas? Isn't that fun? The melody is so simple. Um, I find it really helps as I walk. Da di da di da da dum, da di da 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 dum. Dum da da dee da da dum. Um, it, it, whenever I recite the Buddha's name, and mostly we recite Amitabha, right? Or some people like to recite Guan Yin's name or restore Bodhisattva's name. I find that when I, when I recite the Buddha's name and just let that sound be in my heart and I kind of put my inner ear on it, you know, we talk about the, uh, in, your mind's eye, well, your mind's ear. Put your mind's ear on that sound. It's really easy to be happy. It seems like cares and troubles just kind of vanish because you've got something. We, we haven't talked yet about why Buddha's names have this particular ability to, to influence our lives and to improve things. It has to do with the, the Buddha's vows and what he did when he, like, Shakyamuni coming out of the forest, out of the woods, uh, what they did uh, to create that name uh, of the Buddha. So the Buddha's names are something quite wonderful. Other traditions, oh my goodness, uh, Islam pays strong attention to, uh, to reciting the name of the holy, you know, and you don't mess around, they're very serious about it. Also uh, Hinduism and all the different uh, religions gathered into this stellium of faith called Hinduism, Brahmanism, Hinduism, pays attention to names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, 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 right? 
So, um, okay, I'm not seeing the monks, so let me do it for them. Here we are, just to let you know that Buddha Root Farm is going to be coming up uh, from July 10th to the 17th. I think there's the last chance. If you want to attend, you might be able to get on the waiting list. Uh, click here on visit the website, Buddha Root Farm, and you can find out more about that. Um, June 26th, that would be tomorrow. Uh, you can transfer the merit from reciting the Great Compassion Mantra. There are people who do it uh, many, many times a day, many hundreds of times, and they gather uh, all that merit and virtue of constant recitation and dedicate it. So, and there's a Vietnamese translation and you can uh, join in on that. You uh, fill out a form there. Further, daily ceremonies have resumed. Here are Buddhas from the Ming Dynasty, that is to say 1600. Mm. Looking at Buddhas who have been shedding light and creating blessings for hundreds of years. There they are at the Berkeley Monastery. You can join them uh, for morning ceremony in English and Chinese, three steps, one bow practice, reciting the Buddha's name after lunch, and evening ceremony, um, both in English and Chinese. Okay, uh, the other daily practices are on a break, summer break. Um, so you can still take part, you can uh, join our virtual Buddha hall there uh, at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery from the convenience of your own computer. Hubba hubba. All right, uh, I'm going to Next, pick up our Medicine Buddha mantra and invite you all to join me in transferring merit. Oh, it's not here. I need to go find it. That shouldn't be hard. And encourage you. There we are right there. Make sure I'm sharing that. Okay, there we go. Yes. Um, encourage you to... Uh, not only investigate the value of reciting the Buddha's name, the seven Tathagatas, we've only got three, but we'll get the other four next week. And also this mantra. This mantra comes from Medicine Buddha. Um, it's specifically for healing. And uh, COVID is just right outside your door. If you're lucky, it's not indoors. Uh, one of our dear friends, Steve Boffman, just... Uh, uh, met COVID in a camp in Tennessee, brought it home. So we'll be reciting for Steve and for everyone around the world who is uh, laid low by this virus. And if we recite, uh, we will be able to bring light and energy into our hearts and share that wholesome, balanced energy with other beings. So we use this as a transference device to create goodness around us, family, community, and the planet. So here we go.
The next and last thing we're gonna do is bring up two images here and invite you to join me, bowing to the Buddha. Um, stop my sharing and share again. There we go. I'm gonna make three half bows, you're welcome to join. to the Venerable Master. That will do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week. Take care of yourselves. Amitofo.